Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Honey, I brought you dinner. Um, that's okay. I'm not hungry. But it's your favorite. No, it's your favorite. And I have a headache. But that's what you said last week. First of all, maybe if you check in a little more often, you'd have better luck. Second, I like to eat dinner, a lot. It's just hard to get inspired when it's in and out all the time. Maybe if you changed it up, you know, you could put some thought or effort into it. Okay, I guess I'll just go eat this by myself. You know, I don't even remember. Maybe if you initiated once in a while. On second thought, I could see myself getting pretty hungry if maybe we went out to eat. Really? Yeah, it actually sounds kind of good. Great, I'll grab the keys. We'll go to our favorite place. We can still get there if we hurry. Hun, we've been going there for years. Yeah, since like our honeymoon. I was thinking we could try someplace new tonight, you know, spice things up a bit. Are you serious right now? Okay, uh, <laughs> all right. There's this uh, new place downtown and very spicy and ooh, it's themed. So you get to wear a costume, you get down there, through this weird alley, oh, hey, wait, too exotic? Oh, oh okay, okay. Um, nice little place around the corner, uh, candlelight dinner, uh, soft music. That sounds perfect. Awesome, let's go. Oh, honey, one other thing. Okay, yeah? I don't know if you know this or not, but sometimes on more than one occasion, you have been known to race through dinner to get to dessert, or even sometimes skip the meal altogether to get to dessert. Come on, I love dessert, you know that. Oh, I know, and when I get it, I love it too. But I also like the drinks and appetizers, you know, as build up to the main course. Okay, we'll get apps. And drinks. And drinks too. All right, let's go. Thank you. No, hon, thank you. This is gonna be nice. And you know, I can't wait to catch up after dinner. I think those are some of our best chats. Oh yeah, that reminds me, uh, we can't talk too much. I told the guys I'd meet them for the game. Let me extend a warm welcome to you in the Woodlands, Center Court West, Center Court East. If you're coming to us online, we're glad you've chosen to worship at Faith Bridge. Today is the fourth and final installment in our sermon series that we have been calling The Naked Truth, A Biblical View of Sex. And one of the fundamental truths that we have learned along the way is that God is not opposed to sex, contrary to popular opinion, God is not opposed. I mean, he thought of it. It was his idea. He created it. And he gave it to us as a wonderful gift. However, as the creator, he reserves the right to decide how this gift is to be used. Namely, between one man, one woman, 
in a committed monogamous marriage. Any sexual activity outside of that is outside of the good and perfect will of God. As the video so amply illustrated, though, uh, even when we play by the rules, so to speak, sex can be fraught with difficulty. It's, it's a wonderful gift, but it's also a very complex gift. I can't tell you over the years the number of young uh, engaged couples I've, I've worked with who had the idea that uh, once they were married, it was just going to be one crazy night after another. Well, if you've been married for any length of time, you know that marriage is full of crazy nights, but they may not have anything at all to do with sex. So that's why we want to uh, spend this last message talking about this wonderful gift and how we can use it in such a way that not only honors God but is a blessing to both husband and wife and achieves the purposes for which God intended. To guide our thinking, we are going to be looking at Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Ephesians in the New Testament. We're going to be in chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one. That can be yours to keep. If you have that need, that can be our gift to you. Ephesians chapter 5, we'll begin reading in verse 21. Before we get there, though, let's, let's take a moment and pray together. Father, today we are grateful for the privilege of gathering now in your house to lift up the name of your Son, Jesus, in the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the gift of your written word and its ability to speak into our lives with truth and with power and with conviction. We pray now as we turn our attention to your word, your Holy Spirit would fulfill his promise to be our teacher and to guide us into all truth. We offer our prayer in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Several years ago, my wife Becky and I had the privilege of traveling to South Korea with 14 other pastoral couples. We were there uh, in order to study the largest churches in the world, massive, massive churches over there. And our host was the Reverend Dr. Sundo Kim, at that time the pastor of the largest Methodist church in the world. And Dr. Kim is a, a great, great man. I mean, he, he uh, can genuinely be described as someone, uh, a, a person of gravitas. You, you know you are in the presence of a great man when you are with him. And one of the highlights of the trip was the opportunity that we had, the, the 15 couples, to uh, be a part of a Bible study with Dr. Kim. And so we were ushered into his uh, very spacious office where chairs were set up in a semicircle, and Dr. Kim's lectern was right there in the midst. And after a few minutes, he, he came in and stood there at the lectern, just sort of gazing at each of us. And then, in a very strong, staccato, South Korean accent, he said, Take off your clothes! Okay, uh, did he say take off your clothes? <laughs> so that's how they do church growth over here, huh? <laughs> few minutes, few seconds goes by. He looks at us and he says again, take off your clothes. <laughs> okay, at this point, everybody's starting to squirm a little bit rather uncomfortably. But then, thank goodness, after another moment or two pause, he said, Jesus said, if you would come after me, you must take up your cross. <laughs> yes, yes, of course, take up your cross. We wacky Americans, what were we thinking? Take up your cross. Now, I, I tell you that story because I think it illustrates perfectly the difference between the world's view of sex and a biblical view of sex. 
From a worldly point of view, the most important thing, perhaps the only thing is take off your clothes. I mean, let's get busy. That's what it's all about, right? But from a biblical point of view, the most important thing is not take off your clothes. It's take up your cross. Now, maybe that strikes you as a little odd. What in the world does the cross have to do with my sex life? Well, actually, quite a bit. You see, the essence of taking up one's cross is putting the needs of others before our own. It's becoming a servant. It's recognizing that we meet the needs, we serve others before we take care of ourselves. When Jesus took up the cross, he did so to take care of us. He put our need, namely our need for salvation and forgiveness, ahead of his own need for safety, comfort, and even life. And the primary thing that God wants to accomplish in the life of every Christ follower is to make us more like Jesus. What the Bible calls the process of sanctification, becoming more and more like Christ. And God can and will use any means at his disposal up to and including our sex life in order to accomplish this purpose, to make us all more sanctified, to make us all more like Jesus. That's what Paul was getting at in his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. He writes these words. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and they care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. What Paul is saying here is that the marriage relationship Becoming one flesh is a picture. It it is a beautiful representation of a much higher eternal truth, namely the relationship between Christ and the church. And just as Christ willingly gave himself up for the church, so husbands should give themselves up for their wives. And just as the church surrenders all to Christ, so wives should surrender all to their husbands. And in the process, we begin to reveal the image of God. We begin to learn something about who God is as we fulfill our divine roles that God has given to us as husband and wife. Not only do we begin to learn more about God, but we begin to become more like him. As my uh, friend Paul Looney says, we are created in the image of God, no doubt about it, but we spend the rest of our lives growing up into his likeness. And part of that growth involves submitting to God's will in our respective role as husband and wife. Yes, God can even use our sex life in order to make us more like Jesus, which for my money is not a bad way to be sanctified. Now, 
When I was writing this message, uh, the greatest challenge I had was trying to figure out what not to say. Because uh, there are so many different things that could be said about this topic. I mean, you could come at it from the psychological aspect, the emotional, the physical, the relational, on and on. And of course, there's no time at all to address all of that stuff. And so I decided for our purposes here, we would narrow the focus to, to answer this question. How can God use my sex life to make me more like Jesus? How can God work in and through this special relationship reserved for husbands and wives to make me more like Christ? Even narrowing it to to answer that question, there is still more that can be said in the time that we have. And so I I, I want to approach it this way. Uh, First of all, uh, husbands, I want to talk about a particular sanctifying work that God wants to do in you, unique to you as husbands. And then ladies, I, I want to talk about a particular sanctifying work that God wants to do in you, unique to you as wives. And we will see by the time that we are finished that if we will submit to God's will and allow the Holy Spirit to do the sanctifying work in and through us as we walk in obedience, uh, not only will we learn more about who God is, not only will we become more like Jesus, become more sanctified, but we will also discover that our sex life can be so much more meaningful so much more precious, and ultimately, even more pleasurable. So gentlemen, let's, uh, let's begin with you. There is a unique work that God wants to do within each one of us as husbands. And that work can be summed up in a single word, and that word is pursuit. Pursuit. You know, God has designed women, wives, to be pursued, and he has designed us to be pursuers, and he did that for a reason. He did that to show us something about himself. Our God is a pursuing God. From the very beginning, we see God's pursuit of humanity. Even when he made up his mind to create us, it wasn't like he had to do that. No, he simply desired a relationship with someone who could return that love. And then when Adam and Eve chose to disobey and walk away from God, he would have been well within his rights to say, done with that, finished with that. But no, what did he do? He pursued them in the garden. Where are you? And each one of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Each one of us have turned our backs on God. But God hasn't given up on any of us. No, God comes after us relentlessly. He will not be put off. He is going to seek out every single human heart. He is in pursuit of you and me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Gentlemen, God has made us to be pursuers, to reflect the image of God, that he is a pursuing God, and he has made us pursuers in order to meet the unique need of our wives to be pursued. Now, some of you may be saying to yourself, well, hey, I'm all about that. You know, I'm after sex all the time. Well, here's the deal, guys. We're not talking about pursuing sex. We're talking about pursuing our wives. And there is a big difference between the two. Just as God, first and foremost, pursues our hearts, so we as husbands are first and foremost to pursue our wives' hearts. That is the yearning, aching need of every wife that her husband would pursue her, not for what she can provide, but for who she is, that he recognizes the inherent intrinsic value she has, first of all, as a created image, a person created in the image of God, as his wife, as his spouse, the one to whom he is committed. And he is willing to pursue her whether sex is a part of the equation or not. 
And that's so vital to understand because when we pursue our wives with the primary agenda of sex, you know, gentlemen, they're smarter than we are and it does not take them long to figure out, oh, okay, he must want some because boy, is he turning on the charm. Man, I haven't had this much attention and I don't know when. And how do you think that leaves them feeling? It leaves them feeling used, not loved, and not pursued. And in the pursuit of our wives, not for a minute can we think that if we fulfill our divine role, if we in fact are the pursuers and we are pursuing her heart, she is not thereby obligated then to give us sex. It doesn't work that way. You see, gentlemen, let me remind you, men and women are different. And part of pursuing our wives is patience, a desire to understand, a desire to learn. So what do I do? How do I go about this whole pursuit thing? Well, the starting place is to recognize, number one, sex is not about me. No, sex is not first and foremost about me. Sex is about taking up my cross. It's about recognizing I'm going to meet my wife's needs first. She will come before me. Well, how do I know it? Ask her. Ask her. Have you ever taken the time to sit down and say, honey, I, I don't know that I have ever just really flat out asked, how do you want to be pursued? Each and every woman is different. And what's going to touch one woman's heart is going to be different for another woman. You need to find out. You need to indicate. You know what? This is the main thing I'm interested in. You. You. Not what I'm going to get out of this, but you. That's what I'm really going after. And that is how she is going to be blessed. You see, we forget if our primary objective is pursuing sex, we have greatly diminished the likelihood of sex. But if our primary objective is pursuing our wives' hearts and pursuing them as individuals created in the image of God whom we love, not only do we increase the likelihood of sex, but we have gained something infinitely more valuable. A deepening, meaningful relationship with our wives and we have become just a little bit more like Jesus Well, I'm going to do my part, Pastor Dan, and we'll see what happens. Well, remember, we're not talking about obligation here. We're talking about taking up our cross. Men and women think differently about this. I mean, suppose your wives were to ask you, you want to have sex? She would barely get two words out. Hey, you want to? Yeah. On the other hand, you ask your wife, want to have sex? Her mind is probably going to go something like this. Sex. Hmm. Well, let's see. I promised Laura I would help her with the homework tonight. And then we've got to get Jason to soccer practice and back. And I'm going to have those brownies ready for preschool tomorrow. And I still have to work on my Bible study. Sex. Hmm. Well, maybe. Meanwhile, husband's standing there mystified, wondering, you know, what is the holdup here? It's because we haven't taken time to realize that God has created men with this marvelous capacity to compartmentalize. You know, how does the old saying go? Uh, Women need a reason for sex. Men just need a place. (laughs) Men can compartmentalize and be monofocused. And in certain aspects of life, that's a wonderful gift to have. It's called for. It's needed. But that's not how he's wired our wives. Our wives are multitasking, multi-thinking, and every area of life is impacting their decision about whether or not sex is going to happen. Lots of factors. (laughs) Becky and I have some friends back in Georgia. Episode from their life illustrates this marvelously. Their kids are, are grown and gone now. But we were meeting with them one time, uh, just trying to learn 
about how to do the husband and wife thing better, and they were sharing out of their wisdom. And he told us about a time when, when their children were still small. One afternoon, they decided it was uh, a good time for some afternoon delight. Unfortunately, whoever closed the door did not wait to hear the click of the door. And so just about the time things are getting interesting, suddenly there in the doorway are two wide-eyed and horrified children who commence to scream and run to their own rooms. And this sweet wife, who's just a little bitty thing, said, at that point, I threw my husband seven feet across the room. <laughs> and I am screaming and horrified at this point. We have scarred our children. We have got to do something about this right now. And you know what he said? Can we finish first? <laughs> Guys, we are to be pursuers. <laughs> but sex is not the goal. Sex is a byproduct. The goal is to know and to love our wives and to grow up into maturity in our relationship with Jesus, to show to our wives this side of God that he is a pursuing God. And if you think about it, you know, that's a, a wonderful picture of the gospel. God comes after us unconditionally. Not for what we can do for him, as if we could do anything for him. No, God loves us just for who we are and no other reason. And he pursues us without condition. Becky and I have been married now for uh, 20 years. And I earnestly wish I could stand before you and say that I have faithfully, biblically pursued my wife consistently, but I can't do that. I'm a broken, sinful person too. And it occurred to me um, that maybe the starting place for you, gentlemen, as it has been for me, is confession. It's coming clean to our wives and simply owning the fact, you know, I have been selfish. I have not loved you with a godly love, and I have been more concerned about my needs than yours. Confessing and then repenting, which is a, a Bible word that simply means to stop doing one thing and start doing another. Maybe that's the starting place for you today, is to confess and to repent, and then begin to pursue Pursue so that the image of God is revealed in your life and you grow up in your faith. Now, ladies, there is a particular sanctifying work that God wants to do in you as well. And it, too, can be summed up in a single word. And that word is refuge. Refuge. The sanctifying work that God wants to do in and through you takes place as you provide a safe haven, a place of unconditional acceptance and love for your husband. Now, maybe that strikes you as a bit puzzling, so um, let's, let's do it this way. Let's suppose that you were to wake up tomorrow morning and discover that overnight... Life had changed radically for you. And from that day forward, you are now going to have to live according to this particular code of conduct. You are not to have any close friends or confidants. You are to avoid any show of need, weakness, or tender human intimacy. You may not touch other women without very good reason. You may not cry. You are not encouraged to trust your inner guidance, but only outer authorities and big people. And you are to judge yourself by your roles, titles, car, house, money, and successes. People are either in your tribe or they are a competitive threat or of no interest. 
Ladies, can you imagine living your life that way? I would imagine that you find it distasteful in the extreme. But that is frequently what it is like to live as a man, particularly in our culture. In order to exist in our culture, to thrive, there is an emotional disconnect that a man feels like he has to make in order to be respected by his peers, in order to get ahead, in order to bring home the bacon, in order to feel normal. Is it healthy? No. Is it good? No. Is it what God intended? No. But is it a reality? You better believe that it is. But despite the fact that that is the reality of every man, it does not then take away the abiding need for some sort of emotional connection. There has to be a place where that need is met. It's still there. And God wants to work in and through you to provide that for your husband. It very well may be that the only place in life where he finds that acceptance, that unconditional love and a sense of emotional connection is in your arms. Our God is a God of refuge. My God is is my refuge and an ever-present help in time of trouble. Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Our God is a God who cries out to humanity. I know you're tired. I know it's hard. I know it's difficulty, but come to me. Come to me. I will give you the rest. I will give you the comfort. I will give you the love that your heart so desperately yearns for. And ladies, you can reflect the image of God to your husband as you provide this for him. Now, if you don't know this about him, then in all likelihood, you're going to look at your husband's sex drive as just that a sex drive and nothing more. He's nothing but a walking, talking hormone. But when you come to this realization, and know this, your husband may not even realize it about himself. But when you come to this realization that this is a unique need that God has designed you to meet in your husband's life, it is a beautiful opportunity for you to be a sanctifying presence in your husband's life. Pursuit and refuge, they go together very, very well. To close, I I, want to talk about a a sanctifying work that's not reserved just for men or just for women. It's, It's for all of us who follow Christ. I wouldn't be surprised to learn that right about now, some of you uh, may be thinking, okay, Dan, I I can see what you're saying. Makes sense, pursuit and refuge, men, women, God's. And and it all sounds pretty good here in the safe antiseptic confines of of worship, but but what about real life? I mean, let's get down to brass tacks here. How's this thing really going to work at home where two broken people are trying to make a go of it? And a question that is going to invariably rise in our home is this. Who goes first? Who who goes first? Should the pursuer take the first step? Or should the one who provides refuge do that first? It's a good question to ask because there is risk involved. I mean, what if I pursue and pursue and pursue and there's no refuge? What if I provide refuge over and over and over and there is no pursuit? What does that mean? Is that a risk I'm willing to take? On the last night of his earthly life, you will recall that Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed to the point even of sweating blood because he knew that agony lay ahead. Beating and the cross and death was just around the corner. And I have to think during that long agonizing night, at some point it had to have crossed his mind, is it going to be worth the risk? 
He had no guarantees that we would respond to his love. There were no assurances whatsoever. But in the end, Jesus decided, yes, it is worth the risk. They are worth the risk. And as Christ followers, let me say this, you and I, male or female, we do not get to ask the question, who goes first? We love because he first loved us. And thank goodness he did. Thank goodness he did not wait for guarantees. Thank goodness he did not wait for us to go first because if he had, we would still be dead in our trespasses and sins, bound for a Christless eternity. No, Christ went first. And if we are truly going to reflect the image of God to our spouse, we're not gonna sit around and wait till the other one goes first. Ideally, we're both gonna go first. We're going to honor God and we're going to honor each other as we pursue one another and as we provide refuge. Now, perhaps you think to yourself, well, doesn't pursuit by definition, I mean, doesn't that in some way sort of connote going first? Well, remember, we're we're not primarily talking about roles here. The main thing we're talking about today is taking up your cross. And sometimes that means, sometimes, sometimes it means, ladies, you will provide a refuge not because you're being pursued, but because you love your husband. And sometimes, gentlemen, sometimes, you will pursue your wives Whether sex is the end result or not, that becomes inconsequential. It's about demonstrating the love of Jesus to one another and thereby becoming like Jesus in the process. I'm so glad that on that night, Jesus did take the risk I'm so glad that Jesus did pursue us relentlessly to the point that he even allowed his body to be broken. And I am so glad that he took the risk and offered to be a refuge for you and for me, a place we could run to for the forgiveness of our sins as he spilled his blood. We see in the bread and in the juice the pursuing God and the God of refuge. And I'm going to invite you to come down today to partake of this and to think about these things. And here at Faith Bridge, of course, we have an open table. That is to say, everyone is welcome. Everyone who has a relationship with Jesus or would like to have one, you are welcome to come. I would, though, like to extend, if I may, a a special invitation to husbands and wives That as you come, you not only use this as an opportunity to reflect on the marvelous thing that Jesus has done for us, but also on the marvelous thing that you get to do for your spouse. And if you need to confess and repent, do that. There's no better place than at his table. And then to leave this place, moving forward in your marriage, moving forward in your relationship with God, and learning how to reveal the image of God to your spouse and to grow up in your faith. In just a moment, the ushers will direct you forward to the stations we have here. Uh, The bread is gluten-free. For those of you that have that concern, we'll ask you to take a piece and dip it in the cup and then partake. You're welcome to stay and pray by yourself or as a couple. That would be wonderful. And then you may return to your seat afterward. Um, let's take a moment and pray together. Lord Jesus, it is a amazing and marvelous thing to think that even though we had rejected you and turned our backs on you entirely, still you came after us and you would not be put off 
you would do whatever had to be done up to and including your own death. Thank you for loving us that much. Thank you for your unconditional willingness to forgive, to provide a refuge for us where we could run and find that forgiveness and find that acceptance and that cleansing. We pray now that you would bless this bread and this juice, that they would be for us the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that as we partake, they would serve as a means of grace in our lives, changing us, transforming us, helping us grow up to become the men and the women, the husbands and the wives that you have called and created us to be. And we ask all of this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello and welcome to Postscript. My name is Adam McIntyre and I'm joined today by Pastor Dan Slagle, who just finished up part four of our Naked Truth series talking about marriage and sex. Dan, thank you so much for being here with us today. Sure thing. Uh, first things first, that opening video, uh, that wasn't about dinner, was it? Seriously? Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> I didn't think so. Uh, so let's talk about sex. Um, actually, it. first, uh, Dan, I know that you had a word or two um, more that you wanted to say that you didn't have the opportunity to in the first or second um, sermon. And so I wanted to go ahead and uh, yes, give you that opportunity. Yes, I do. And, and that was the reminder that no one, if they're struggling in this area or any area of marriage, don't feel like you have to go it alone. Mm -hmm. uh, we have help. We have people here uh, who can talk to couples, talk to individuals, and if we don't have uh, the help that you're looking for. We know people right. who can provide that help. So don't, don't miss out on that opportunity. Yeah, that's so important. And it's really difficult uh, for a lot of people to make that ask because this is such a deeply personal issue. It, oh, it is. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have worked with couples in the past who came al almost too late mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> for the sake of their marriage because this was, uh, for them, a source of shame, something sure. that was too personal to want to talk about. But my goodness, uh, better a little bit of embarrassment now for a long life together right. than to just pretend as if it isn't there and maybe even lose the marriage. That's so right. don't, don't let that be the thing that stops you. Absolutely, absolutely. And it, there might be some couples um, in, uh, who are listening to this that uh, sex is way down the list of of issues in their marriage, of problems in their marriage. Uh, do you have a word or two for those couples? Sure, you know, the, the gist of the message was taking up one's cross. Right. It, it was, uh, we, we happen to be talking about sex, but that, that's an overarching principle for every area of life and certainly every area of married life. And so to whatever degree that sacrificial approach, putting right. your spouse first can apply to that, um, then, you surely want to do that, but um, I, I would uh, counsel couples, uh, particularly for the wife's sake, to be proactive in addressing those other issues. Right. Because until those sorts of things are settled in her heart, that is gonna be a constant distraction to developing a, a, a healthy sex life right. together. So don't you know, think that, oh, we can just, you know, sex our way through this, that, right. that that's not going to happen. No, absolutely not. And I, I think that's uh, so important to just your overall word of our marriage is supposed to reflect Jesus and the church. And yeah. so whatever the issue is, whether it's sex or it's something else, we take up our cross. We, right. we love, we serve sacrificially one another so that we reflect the gospel exactly. to the world around us. Yep. Um, and then finally, uh, for those who are uh, single mm -hmm. watching this, um, who are not yet married, but maybe one day they, they will be or they want to be. Um, do you have a word for our singles? Sure. Um, yeah, I can see how they would feel a bit excluded since we talked uh, exclusively about marriage today. But I, I would say this to any uh, single individual. Um, learning to take up one's cross doesn't start the day you get married. Sure. 
you know, that, that is a, a life style, a life approach, a habit that you can cultivate at any point. And married life will be so much better for you and for your spouse if each of you are learning to do that in all areas of life, rather than being a, a selfish individual and then suddenly landing in marriage and realizing, oh my goodness, I've, I've got to start working on this. So, so do yourself a favor and take up your cross now. Absolutely, man, that's so important. Of If you try to start taking up your cross the moment that you get married, it, it's, it's gonna be tough to it do. It is gonna be tough. But if you're practicing that beforehand, it's just gonna uh, make things so much um, smoother. And then, and again, then you're, you're already beginning to reflect That's right. that relationship, the yeah. church and Jesus and all of those things. And yeah. so, well, thank you so much, Pastor Dan, sure. for being here. Thank you for your word. It was great. And thank you all for tuning in. We will see you all next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.